so great to see you today. We thank you for your presence. We thank God for how abundant he is and this good day, great day he's given us to begin the week. There's no better place to begin our day and our week than at the throne of God. We thank you for your presence today to do that. We thank you uh, for your well wishes while we were away. We're so glad to be back, thankful to be back. We were already scheduled to be out of town, also had a little bit of a quarantine kind of situation to write out. So we're just thankful that everybody is healthy and is doing great, and we're thankful to be back with you this morning. Before we dive into this morning's study, special announcement that is in the bulletin this morning. And first time I think we believe, that I believe we've announced it publicly, but uh, something we've been planning for a little while, that um, this coming, not this coming week, Friday week from now, the 29th, so almost two weeks from now, Friday, October 29th, we'll feed the Oakland High School football team, the cheerleaders, and their coaches. And we're thankful we have so many good groups and teams at all the different schools in our areas that are led by coaches who do so out of a concern for character, out of concern for doing things the right way. That's not exclusive to Oakland or exclusive to the football team. It's all sorts of other teams that do that, and we're just thankful to be able to help them out from time to time. And so we're thankful that this opportunity is upon us in a little less than two weeks, the 29th, to feed the football team and the cheerleaders and their coaches. If you'd like to help out with that, there is a way in which you can. Just let us know and we'll put you in a place that you can best serve. See Paul Graves for that information or see myself, we'll get you those details. But please know that you're needed, that your smiling face, your ability to serve the food perhaps, to welcome them. It's, if you're kind of from this area especially, you're going to know some of their parents and so forth. So please know that you're needed and uh, we would love to put you in a place to be able to help with that. Among those that we'll be feeding, Coach Sage Harding coaches the wide receivers for the football team. And then Lila Adkins is co-captain for the cheerleaders. So we're thankful that they're making an influence where they're at. And we want to serve them and serve those teams. Be praying for this event, praying for this opportunity. And if you'd like to serve and help, let us know and we'll put you in the best place we can. All right. King Ahab, not a good king. Not a good king at all. He had some ups and downs. He had some times when maybe you thought he's going to kind of turn things around, but he always goes back to that evil wife, Jezebel. And he had defeated an army to the north in Syria, led by Ben-Hadad, a pagan. And God had given Ben-Hadad over to his hands, with the expectation, the instruction to kill Ben-Hadad. But Ahab spares his life, and he does so out of his own personal desires. This is going to serve me the best, so I'm not going to kill this other king. He lets him go. So a prophet from God has to go and confront Ahab about this and pass along to him the judgment of God. And what the prophet does is similar to what Nathan the prophet did for King David when he sinned with Bathsheba and then Uriah and that whole mess. This prophet dresses up as if he is a wounded soldier. And he goes to Ahab and he tells him the scenario. He says, I was in battle. And another soldier came up, and he had a captive from the other army. And he assigned that captive to me, and I was to watch over him. And he said, his life for your life. I was to keep track of him no matter what. But then he said these words, the words on your screen. And as your servant was busy here and there, he was gone. So he's fabricating this as if it's a real thing, but to make a point to King Ahab. He says, I got busy here and there, and my responsibility of taking care of this captive, he left. Listen to King Ahab's words. This is not really wisdom. It's just common sense. It's just a natural reaction. So shall your judgment be. You yourself have decided it. That's 1 Kings chapter 20 and verse 40. You yourself have decided it. You understood you got busy. You understand you got distracted. You understand you let him leave. So then the prophet drops the costume. He's no longer pretending. He reveals his identity and says, and so too is the case with you and Ben-Hadad. And because you did not take his life, God will now answer for your life. You will have to answer to God with your own life. Important question. What do we risk what do we risk and what do we lose when we are busy here and there? 
And while being busy here and there, we neglect the most primary roles God assigns us to. We understand that we can do a lot of things as a family. We can work a lot of hours for our family to buy a lot of things for our family. But until we seek God for wisdom and understanding about how to grow and love within the family, we risk losing it all simply because we were busy here and there. And then they're gone. What we want to notice this morning as we continue teaching through and studying through the book of Colossians, we began that journey back in April. And now we've come to the part of the text in chapter 3 and beginning of verse 18 where he introduces some specific instructions for families. What we want to notice this morning is that families are clearly important to Christ and to his church. This is a letter about the church, and yet Paul, by inspiration of God, sends along some direct communication about families. So the takeaway must be Christ and his church must be important to families. Since families are important to Christ, Christ must be important and primary to our families. Now, what we're going to do is in a moment we'll get to chapter 3, verses 18 through 21, the specific passage that kind of prompts our discussion this morning. But before we do that, we want to understand that the whole book of Colossians has been preparing us for some things that will be helpful in our homes. Clearly, God gave us this text for a reason, so we're going to address it and study it. But also, we need to understand there is a connection between everything he tells us about faithfulness and about loving one another and serving one another that also connects to our roles and responsibilities within our homes. And so just as we keep committing ourselves more and more to Christ, how that causes and helps our church to be stronger, so too the more we keep submitting to Christ in everything, it causes our families, our homes, to grow stronger and stronger. If we kind of take this task of describing a Colossians church... A church or a family, excuse me, a Colossians family. What's a Colossians family look like? Just kind of surveying the whole book. Well, you describe the, the letter kind of in one single purpose. Remember, Paul is concerned about these false influences around them. He doesn't want them to be deluded by plausible arguments. Well, we need to ask the question, are we going to allow influences around us, whether that's media or entertainment or if it's people around us? Maybe in our families, maybe in our communities. Will we allow those influences to direct and lead our homes? Or will we allow Christ to lead us in our homes? And so the, the last verse we've covered, chapter 3 and verse 17, that we sang right before we, we started this, this sermon time this morning, what might begin to change if we just thought about that verse in connection to our homes? Whatever you do. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. See, as opposed to going to and listening to all these other sources, what if we decided everything first goes through Christ and what he desires for the home, but also for my role within the home? Now, let's look at three of these. You could do this hundreds and hundreds of these through this book alone. And so maybe if you're just a little stale at home, or if you're just kind of extra busy or uh, some extra concerns, maybe it would be helpful to read through all of Colossians this afternoon or tonight before bed and just begin to make a list. What are some of the principles about Christ that would help me be better within the walls of this home? We'll look at three before we dive into chapter 3 and verse 18. Number one, the question might be from chapter 1 and verse 13, how do kingdom families live? How do kingdom families live? See, in chapter 1 and verse 13, he's setting us up to see how wonderful Christ is. And he reminds us that God has moved us. When he saves us, he moves us, notice, from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Every Christian is a part of his kingdom, the church. We're all kingdom people. Families made up of Christians are kingdom families. Now, don't we use... That phrase from time to time about other things, we love to say we're a blank family. It's a coal mining family, a, an education family. This is a family family. 
Right? We do that. It's an Alabama family. We're an Auburn family. We're a, a Disney family. We're outdoors family. We, we do that all the time. And think about this. Those are not just mere adjectives about things that we envision. They reflect our habits. They are connected to things that we do, and thus they describe who we are. Really wild example. You'll see it happening soon. Hear people talking about it soon. I don't know why it crossed my mind. But in a few weeks, you'll start hearing people say, well, we are a family who pulls out all the decorations even before Thanksgiving. Anybody along those lines? Right? Well, we're just a, fa or we're a family who waits until after Thanksgiving. Right? We're just prone to describing ourselves that way. So what might change within our homes if we thought about and talked about ourselves as a kingdom family, a kingdom of God family, a kingdom of Christ family? Would our habits change? Would our schedules change? Would our words, our thoughts change? That's been God's design all along for the family, even before the plan of the church was fully revealed and carried out. All along, God has communicated to his people, the family is the bedrock for continual, continual faithfulness of my people. So Psalm 78, for instance, the parents there, the adults, are concerned about the children and their children and their grandchildren. And so chapter 78 of Psalms, verse 4, he says, we're not going to hold back. We're going to tell them of the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his might, his power, and about the wonders he has done. We're, we're going to keep talking about the things of God. Why? You see the purpose in verse 7, that they should set their hope in him. Their longings, their motivations are all rooted in God. That they should not forget his works. Think about the difference in not forgetting versus remembering. It's one thing to remember from time to time. It's another thing to never forget. And the task for families is we're going to be a home that never forgets all of the mighty works of God. And the last purpose in verse 7 of Psalm 78 is that they should keep his commandments. Hope. Not forgetting. Obedience. Keeping his commands. That's God's design that the family works together and grows together to keep creating those who would follow after God. You remember Jesus' significant promise. It's a command tied to a promise. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God, kingdom of God, and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. What are the, all these things there? In context, it's food, it's clothing. You go back before that in chapter 6, it's money. And then all the things that we're busy here and there about. Go back to our original opening story there from Ahab. Jesus specifically says, when you seek first his kingdom, his rule, his authority, his people, and his righteousness, God provides everything, everything that we think we need otherwise. And we so often use as distractions from doing the will of God. Second observation from Colossians. What, what kind of descriptions describe a Colossians family? Elsewhere in chapter 1, we need to remember that Christ is the source of reconciliation and peace. Chapter 1 and verse 20. This is after he's talked about how Christ is the supreme creator God. He's the one responsible for creating creation, therefore he is qualified to be our recreator, the one who saves us from sin. So, through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. What does reconciliation mean? It means making peace. You get to chapter 3 and verse 13, there's a reminder of bearing with one another and forgiving one another, that just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive Peace comes up in verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Where does that peace come from? The wisdom, the strength to bear with and to forgive from the peace of Christ. Why does that matter in the home? Because that's where we from our earliest ages learn how to, or maybe even whether or not to, 
reconcile the way God shows us how to reconcile, to forgive how God shows us to forgive and how he forgives us. Because we live in such close confines within a home and a family, because of these naturally close relationships, it's only going to happen. It's, it's just naturally going to happen that we're going to cross each other from time to time. We're going to let one another down. We're going to mistreat each other. We might accidentally do that. We might have some ill intent at times. Where will we learn the forgiveness of God, the patience of God toward each other if we don't exercise it and learn it within the home? Third observation from chapter 2, early in that chapter. Homes are places for constant encouragement and love and assurance. Chapter 2, verse 2, right before he says, I'm saying all this to keep you from being deluded or deceived. In verse 4, he says that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of the, God's mystery, which is Christ. That's about all he gives us in his word. And that how we can be encouraged and knit together in love as a church but do we see how also those are beautiful descriptions for God's design for the home? That the home, every day after school and every day after work and every morning after we wake up and on long days and difficult days and days of loss and days of change, we find courage from each other because we all collectively find courage from God. We're knit together. Isn't that a beautiful image? Knit together. How? In love. Love that we know from God and that we receive from God. And we find assurance from God. So when we each find our collective assurance through knowledge in God, we're then best equipped to serve each other and to encourage each other to love one another within the walls of our homes. But now let's move to chapter 3, verse 18 through 21 and read these specific instructions to these specific roles. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Quick word here about why these are here. Clearly we have a lot of things that are helpful already in Colossians and the rest of the New Testament to help us to exercise his love toward one another within the home. But we need some specific instructions as well. So just envision, say, a restaurant. Maybe if you're going to go to a restaurant this afternoon for lunch, and that restaurant has an owner, and he's going to be away for a few weeks, and he sends a letter, he sends a memo or an email to every employee. You've got chefs or cooks. You've got some waitresses. You've got some dishwashers. Do you want to go to a, a restaurant where the dishwashers don't know what to do, where they're lazy, where well, they don't clean the dishes properly? Do we ever go to back to restaurants who we have a poor interaction with a waitress or a waiter and they're rude? Typically that's a big turnoff for the next time, right? We all want a chef who knows how to cook, who knows the difference in salt and sugar. So we, we understand the difference in the roles. Now, that owner may send a letter or an email and have a series of instructions for all of them. But then he also might say, now, chefs, you be sure to do this. Waitresses, you be sure to be this. Dishwashers, you be sure to do this. See, he would have a specific instruction tied to a specific role because that role bears a specific responsibility. And so as we quickly walk through these four verses, notice the command is tied to role, which thus has a responsibility. Number one, we notice wives. Wives, the command is to submit. Submission is the natural response to trust and respect. Paul explains this further in Ephesians 5, that just as we as the church trust and respect Christ's leadership and thus submit to him, so too wives are to trust and respect the leadership of their husbands. The background of this word deals with orderly, orderliness placing in order, in the proper place. It's underneath the right structure. And you see that reflected again at the end of the verse, right? Because it says this is fitting 
in the Lord. This is the right place for harmony of the whole family. Titus 2 and verse 5 reminds us that older women are to teach the younger women to submit to their husbands. It starts the earliest of ages to learn to submit. 1 Peter 3 and verse 5 reminds us about those women of old, say Sarah and her submission to Abraham. It calls them women who hope in God, but then it says they adorn themselves by submitting to their husbands. Their beauty, their posture, their status is depicted in how they follow the lead and trust the lead of their husbands. So the Christian woman today who understands Christ and submits to Christ will have no hesitations when it comes to submission to her husband's leadership. But next, let's drop down to verse 20 and see the children who were addressed. Obedience here is a stronger word than submission when it comes back to verse 18. Here it's obey your parents. So kind of the same general sphere, but much stronger. It is directly tied to behavior. Do what you're told. Don't do what you're not told. That's the expectation of children who live under the authority of their parents. So in Mark chapter 1, the demons are baffled because they obey the voice of God. They obey the voice of Jesus. Jesus speaks, the demons obey his voice. Mark chapter 4, the winds and the waves obey the voice of Jesus. Now think about those two instances as illustrations. The demons, these evil spirits that were active in the first century, they were against even the mission of God and of Christ. And when Jesus spoke, they complied. They did it. Winds and the waves were on one course. They were raging. They were boisterous. But then they ceased. They changed their course when Jesus spoke. They did exactly what Jesus told them to do. So children, teenagers, do we see what Paul tells us, what God tells us? The proper response to God while we're in our homes is to obey our parents. Now, let's follow this up with something that might be helpful. It's not inherently a bad thing to ask questions and to ask even why. God even rewards that way of thinking. Remember over and over again in the Old Testament, he says to the Israelites, when your children ask you why, or they ask you what is the meaning of this, he gives them the meaning. He says, here's what you're to tell them. There's good, healthy learning that comes from asking questions. But let's try something, all right? Let's reverse the order from how we're so prone to do it. So the next time, the next time you're told to do something or not to do something by your parents, then comply, obey, do it. And then after you've done it and you've smiled and you've not rolled your eyes and you've not huffed and puffed, you've kept a good attitude, then calmly ask, can we talk about that? Can we talk about why you told me to do that? Can I ask why you didn't let me go to the concert? Can I ask why you didn't want me around that person? Comply, obey, submit, and then ask and have a good conversation and see how that begins to change your relationship between you and your parents. But third, we men, husbands and fathers, we have different roles based on whether we're serving our spouse or our children. But you'll notice there is a lot of similarity in the two responses he gives, two commands he gives to the men here. We're to exercise the sacrificial love that God gives to us. Agape is the word in verse 19 toward wives. Love your wives. Back in Ephesians 5, it's love your wives just as Christ loved the church. There are a handful of documents from the first century, pagan documents and Greek, Roman culture documents, and they were called household tables. And it was just this person or that person's you know, tips for being a better wife or better husband or you know, similar kind of processes to what Paul does here. And you might even see it in today's magazines or blog posts. Of all the ones we have preserved, not a single one of those contains the word love. So in the first century, outside of Paul's inspired writings here and outside of other Christian writings, no one 
in that culture would say love has a place in the home. No one used the word agape to describe the husband-wife relationship until God began to use it about himself toward us. And then now he says, husbands, this is the kind of sacrificial spirit you must always show to your wife. And don't be harsh with her. Don't allow her to become bitter through your own bitterness. Likewise, you don't provoke your children. That's a clear connection to love. You look at the qualities of love in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is not arrogant. It's not rude. It does not insist on its own way. Think about that one, dads, husbands. We don't insist on our own way. Who does a godly father insist on the way of? The way of Christ. Love does not, is not irritable. It's not resentful. God shows us and tells us what true love from him is. And then he does not shy away from. He does not apologize for looking at us men. And saying, here's the highest standard of behavior. And you're to live it out. You're to exercise it to these people in your lives. It's as if he says, I am entrusting these precious lives and souls into your care. Nothing less than exercising love. Love that I've shown you is acceptable. Now, three quick observations about these three commands, these four verses in these commands. Number one, this just connects the dots. Our faithfulness in Christ is what helps us exercise these specific responsibilities. If we feel like we don't know where to start with submission or with love or with obedience, well, if we're a Christian, we understand those things. We, we have not become a Christian without first understanding those. So all of our faithfulness feeds into our specific responsibilities. Number two, Paul's giving of these commands is given to and assumes a symbiotic relationship, which means everybody is working toward the best interest of everybody else. Okay? Paul writing this, or Paul writing in Ephesians 5, is not directly intended to address every difficult situation we can create. Now, these might be good starting points, or the best starting points when we face those. Let's just be sure we're kind of clear on that. That I need to assume my spouse and my children are, are doing the best they can unless there's something that's clear is off. Then we work through that in other ways that come from God and his word. But we're always assuming they're assuming the best and we assume the best and we keep loving and we keep submitting the best interest of the other person. But number three, key phrase is the Lord. You'll notice the wives are told to submit because this is fitting in the Lord. The children are told to obey because it pleases the Lord. We didn't talk about it, but verse 22 addresses bond servants and their submission is tied to in the Lord. See, in the Lord is another highly, highly exclusive phrase. You don't find people in the first century outside of the church, outside of Christians, talking about family motivation being God and Christ and the things of Christ. But this is not just about you. This is not just about me. This is about the Lord this is about us continuing to serve and love each other because of how much God has loved and served us. It is the supreme motivation for each person within each role of the home. And so finally, as we conclude this morning, God's instructions for the family here or anywhere else are not given to shame us. They're not given for us to then use them to manipulate other people. They are ultimately hopeful. They're ultimately hopeful positive because we always get to begin where he says to begin we always get to look and to say well here I am in this text and I can begin by exercising what he tells me to exercise my attention doesn't have to be on my spouse or on my children about, or my parents about what they're doing wrong instead I get to devote my attention to my soul and how it serves their lives what a great blessing that then becomes when we exercise that humility, instead of drawing ourselves into unnecessary shame. Now, if it brings out true, honest guilt, maybe that needs to happen. I've, I've fallen short of this standard. I need to correct that standard. But these are intended to be positive, hopeful starting points for us. What would happen if we read these passages and we understand what's now expected of us? We would just begin to ask, not or say, not that we have to, but that we get to. 
We get to raise children for God. We get to serve a spouse in the name of God. We get to. We don't have to. And then what if we actually include that we on the front end? We, as a family, we get to serve the Lord. We get to elevate Christ in our home by loving and serving each other. When the psalmist penned Psalm 133, clearly the, the original context would have been the people of God, the brethren, maybe even a tribe or the priests. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. But how good and pleasant it likewise is and always can be when homes dwell together in unity of the Lord. It is a joy. It's a joy to see homes that live for the Lord and they keep producing throughout the decades. We see five, six, seven decades of faithful, loving lives in the Lord. It's also a great joy when young homes are built and we see their first days beginning in Christ. And how great are the joys in homes that maybe have been around for several years or even decades and they experience uncertainty, loss, difficulties and betrayal perhaps. How great a joy it is to see them rebuild, repair themselves and their home through the love of Christ. How great a joy that can be for each of us and for our homes that God makes available through Jesus. This morning, there's no question the best thing you can do for your family and for your home is to be sure that your life and your soul are right with God. If that means putting him on in baptism by being immersed in water where he forgives, let today be the day you make that decision. Put him on. Do, it, do that today. If you need to express the need for forgiveness and the need for establishing some steps of repentance in the future, let today be that day as well. Please know that we, we stand here ready to help and to pray and to forgive you. And God does as well. He'll rejoice and we'll rejoice with you. If you have those needs, know that we're here. Come as we sing.